And then uh, the next day, uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve, uh, I did a presentation, a full presentation there at the Caress Unity Center uh, in Los Angeles. And that presentation was entitled African American Resistance in the Era of Donald Trump. Voter suppression, reparations, and high elections have consequences. African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump. Voter suppression, reparations, and high elections have consequences. And uh, that information, along with the sources, the documentation, really, really blew people away, opened their eyes. And um, if you've seen that presentation before, uh, had new information as well. And luckily for you, those in the Detroit area, I will be doing that presentation at the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located at 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. I will be doing that presentation on Sunday, January 14th, 2018, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. So we'll have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, and then Saturday, the day before, Saturday, January 13th, uh, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., I'll be doing a presentation as well at the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located at uh, 71 Oakman Avenue. That presentation, since it's Dr. King weekend, and we know Dr. King Day is coming up um, on uh, Monday, January 15th, I'll be doing my presentation uh, entitled The Distortion of the Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. The distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television. Okay, so I'll be doing this presentation on Saturday, December, I mean, Saturday, January 13th, not December, Saturday, January 13th, uh, 2018, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe. Located at one, located at 71 Oakman Avenue, 71 Oakman Avenue, in Highland Park, Michigan. All right, and if you've never seen that presentation, even if you've seen it before, it's, it's an expanded presentation. I have some new information in that one as well. And you know, I don't get a, uh, asked to speak a lot for Dr. King Day celebrations. You know, and the reason why is because I don't do Negro Dr. King Day celebrations. I don't, I don't, when I say that, I mean presentations. I don't do Negro Dr. King presentations. No, I deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. I deal with, you know, Dr. King that supported the black power movement. I, I, I deal with the facts and evidence. I deal with the Dr. King who met with African heads of state, like Kwame Nkrumah. And Dr. King went to Ghana for, uh, in 1957 for the celebration of Ghana's independence and went back each year up until his assassination. I deal with Dr. King, who said that the U.S. Gov that, that the that the uh, largest purveyor of violence in the world was his own government. He said that in 1967, in April of 1967, when he came out in opposition against the Vietnam War. See, I deal with the real Dr. King. We're gonna break down the "I Have a Dream" speech because that wasn't even the original name of the speech. We'll talk about what that's about. We'll deal with the Birmingham campaign in 1963, the Albany movement in 1961 to 62. We'll deal with it how in the civil rights movement. It wasn't successful because of marching. They used targeted, sustained economic withdrawal strategies. They redistributed the pain. So I don't deal with Negro Dr. King celebrations. No, we deal, we deal with the real Dr. King. And this is what a lot of people don't want to talk about. We talk about, uh, one of the things I deal with is how the civil rights movement was not a nonviolent movement. If it had not been for Negroes with guns, you would not have had a civil rights movement. Nobody wants to talk about that. Very few people. You know, a lot, a, lot, a lot of the events that take place, they don't want to deal with the armed resistance that took place during the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't just deacons for defense and justice. Before that, you got Robert F. Williams and the Black Guard, who was the president of the Monroe County chapter of the NAACP in North Carolina. So, so oftentimes when we talk about the Civil Rights Movement, that portion, the armed resistance, is not dealt with. The targeted, sustained economic boycotts are not dealt with. So th this is why the name of this presentation that I do is called The Distortion of the Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary will not be televised on the television because they don't want to show you the revolutionary Dr. King on the television. This is why when you look, when, you, when they show clips of his last speech, April 3rd, 1968, I've been to the mountaintop. They show you the last two minutes when he talks about how uh, 
uh, I, you know, I've, I've uh, seen the promised land, and, and uh, we as a people will get to the promised land. I may not get there with you. They talk about that. Well, the speech is 43 minutes. They don't talk about in the speech where he talks about how the, uh, he, he, he says that we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Where he told them to go while he was speaking in Memphis, Tennessee during a sanitation workers uh, 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 strike. He, he told them to go, he told them to tell your friends and family in Memphis, Tennessee to boycott Coca-Cola and Hearts Bread and Wonder Bread and sell test milk because of the discriminatory hiring practices. He talked about how African Americans had an economy of $30 billion. And he said that's a lot of money if you know how to pool it. He talked about supporting black institutions financially. So, so the revolutionary Dr. King is not talked about on the television. I wonder why. Why, why has his legacy been distorted? Why has his legacy been sanitized? Why has he been emasculated? Dr. Cornell West called it the Santa Clausification of Dr. King. The Santa Clausification of Dr. King. Dr. King's been reduced to this, uh, to this, this man that just loved everybody and, 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 and he, he had no backbone. No, that's not the real Dr. King. So that's what we'll deal with. January, Saturday, January 13, 2018, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, 71 Oakman Avenue in Holland Park, Michigan. You don't want to miss that free event. Donations accepted. Come on out. Bring the family. You're going to be blown away. And then the next day, Saturday, January 14, 2018, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the same location, the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe will deal with African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump. Voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. So, welcome to the African History Network show. Once again, we're live Sunday, January 7, 2018. 2018, Happy New Year. New Year, same old stuff, right? So on tonight's show, we got a lot to talk about because I haven't been on, I think, about three weeks. The station was shut down for a couple of weekends, and I was in and out of town doing lectures and things like this, right? So this is what we're going to talk about tonight. First of all, we know February 16th, the Black Panther movie comes out from Marvel uh, Comics and Disney, because Disney bought Marvel, all this, you know. <laughs> but um, you have some chatter on social media about some African-American women, some, some African-American women, there were articles about this, uh, saying they were going to boycott the new Black Panther movie because uh, one of the stars in the movie, uh, Michael B. Jordan, uh, is allegedly dating uh, a Hispanic woman. Now, some people said she was white. She's Hispanic, number one. Okay. All right. Um, but now you have AtlantaBlackStar.com is reporting that many African-American women, women are pushing back on, this, uh, on these rumors of a boycott. Right. So we'll talk about that. What's interesting is that the woman who he is allegedly dating, because up until today, I haven't seen any confirmation from Michael B. Jordan that he's actually dating her, he showed up to a Kwanzaa event with her. So the African-American women who are saying that they're going to boycott or who are speaking out on Twitter, Twitter, the question I ask you is, how many Kwanzaa events did you attend during Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa is December 26th through January 1st. How many Kwanzaa events did you attend? So next question, the next thing we'll talk about is this past week, this past week, Thursday, this was a crazy, crazy week. We know the new book from uh, 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 Michael Wolf uh, came out, uh, uh, Fire and Fury, and Donald Trump is going crazy uh, <laughs> trying to refute all, these, uh, uh, all this information about him being incompetent and acting like a child. All you have to do is follow him on Twitter. You can could, you could see that uh, what Michael Wolf is saying is correct, okay? But this past Thursday, Attorney General Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III reversed President Obama's policy dealing with legalized marijuana and how federal prosecutors will handle this, okay? Elections have consequences. Now, how many weed smokers did not vote in the 2016 election? Ask yourself this question. How many weed smokers did not see this coming? Because, because if you look, if you listen to Trump prior to the election, Trump said he would leave it up to the uh, states, legalize marijuana, right? Okay, and, but Trump also ran on the platform of law and order. So a lot of weed smokers decided to stay at home. Now, uh, I did a podcast this, uh, early this week, and I dealt with the topic of stop using the term hotep as an insult. 
because there was an article from Huffington Post Black Voices about this. I did about an hour and a half video. You can go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the banner for my YouTube channel, and we got the information there. Okay, you can, you can watch the video. One of the things I talked about is how um, you you looking at uh, a reversal in the policy from President Obama. And in the 2016 uh, election, on some, in some states, it was on the ballot to legalize marijuana either for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes, okay? And what was interesting, there was a, a, a story from um, MSNBC back in September 2016, and I'll pull it up for you. I'll give you the information, okay? What's interesting, Jacob uh, Soboroff, of MSNBC, he was uh, on location in, I think it was Virginia, West Virginia, something like that. I, I, I'll get the exact state in just a minute. He was talking to some millennials. And millennials, the millennials he interviewed, it was about three or four of them. They said that they were not going to vote for president, but they were going to vote to legalize marijuana in their state. Talk about how elections have consequences. They said they were not going to vote for president, but they were going to vote to legalize marijuana in their state. You must not understand <laughs> that it was President Barack Obama, his directives to the Department of Justice, which, which backed off of using federal prosecutors to prosecute uh, for marijuana usage and things like this in states where it was legal for medicinal marijuana or for recreational purposes. But now, with this reversal from Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, who's totally against the legalization of marijuana under any circumstances, whether it's medicinal purposes, whether it's recreational purposes, now it's left up to federal prosecutors to decide to go ahead and prosecute. Well, if you go and look at national statistics, you find that African, you find that the usage rate among for marijuana among African Americans and, and European Americans or white people is almost identical. Yet African Americans have an arrest rate of four times, uh, they're more likely to be arrested uh, four times as much as white people for marijuana. So what, so what does this really do? And then May 12, 2017, we know that Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, Donald Trump's Attorney General, redeclared the war on drugs that was winding down under President Obama. So, you talk about how elections have consequences. Now, I just find it very interesting that you have people who said they were going to go to the polls and vote for medical, medical marijuana or vote for recreational marijuana, but they weren't going to vote for president. So, this clip from MSNBC.com, you can pull this up. And check this out. September 30, 2016. It's, it's called, How Important is the Marijuana Vote? How important is the marijuana vote? Five states, including Nevada, will vote on whether marijuana should be legalized for recreational use. MSNBC's Jacob Soboroff reports if marijuana voters will help Hillary Clinton in the swing state of Nevada. So he interviewed some millennials. They said, we're not going to vote for president, but we're going to smoke. We're going to vote for, for, for uh, medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. How idiotic is that? Then you had this story. Uh, uh, not, a lot of news outlets reported on this. We posted this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. We got a lot of traction from this story. 63 people were arrested at a house party for less than one ounce of weed. Is that, I mean, come on. Are you serious? 63 people were arrested. You got to wait till you hear the details of this. Because if this had been 63 white people, oh, they would not have been arrested. I guarantee you that. If this had been 63 white people, this wouldn't, no, no, no. Majority, African American, lock them up, lock them up. But when you look at the argument for legalizing marijuana, number one, it should have never been made illegal in the first place. That goes that you have to understand history. That goes back to Harry J. Anslinger, who was the first chairman of the National Narcotics Commission, and him lying in his testimony in front of the U.S. Congress. Because there were rumors that white women sexually craved black men when they were high on marijuana. This is for real. This is history. Okay? And then they implemented the marijuana prohibition tax in 1937. This, the reason why marijuana was made illegal in the first place was because of lies.
And it, it, it wasn't because of the drug itself. It was who was using the drug. As long as white people were using it, it was called cannabis or hemp. Then in the early 1900s, you had Mexicans coming to this country. And the, the apathy and the vitriol and the hatred towards Mexicans became associated with the term, a, a Spanish term that was used for it. So they used marijuana. Marijuana is not what it's historically called. It's called hemp or cannabis. But then when, then when who was using the drug changed, now all of a sudden, now they want to change the drug laws. You're dealing with white supremacy. Some people don't want to call it that. If you know a better word, let me know. But we're going to go with white, white supremacy for nothing. That's what you're dealing with. Same reason why cocaine was made illegal. Cocaine used to be legal. Sigma Freud was a cocaine addict. When, when, when black men started using cocaine, go back to February 8th, 1914. New York Times had a big article called uh, dealing with uh, uh, Negro cocaine fiends have now turned to uh, sniffing because of uh, uh, pro because whiskey uh, is illegal because of prohibition, something to that effect. February 8th, 1914. Okay, 104 years ago, New York Times. And there's a fear now. You know, what would happen when these black men are high on cocaine, when they try to rape white women? They, they were asking the question, because I went and read this article. I had, to, I had to pay a subscription, to a digital subscription to the New York Times to be able to go in their archives and read this article from 104 years ago. It's from February 8th, 1914. 